And they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread and in prayers. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders, and all that believed were together and had all things common. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. Hey, my name is John, one of the pastors here, and you got to love a morning when we do baptism. Like, that's just, that's just a party right there, yeah? Like, yeah, you can celebrate that. That's good. That's good. Um, you know, I was thinking this week, um, I, I, here's the thing. I, one of my favorite things to do is kind of create a space where, where God can just move and, you know, God can speak. And I was just thinking, us gathering here, like, on a Sunday morning, like, we are joining an uncountable number of people who over generations have done this, where we come together, and it's, it's like the song we just sang, right? The same God then, same God now. Like, we're looking, we're looking to God for so many of the same things, right? Like, and our goal in this time is to create a space for God to speak and for God to move. And I just thought, you know what, Let, let's just start off kind of with that reminder that that, that reminder that we have a God who is living and active, who says he'll never leave us or forsake us, who says when we pray that he'll hear us, that, that he will provide exactly what you need when you need it. And so I thought, it would, what, it just, what, it would, what would it look like just this morning to say, hey, let's create a space where we really want to take a, just take a moment and pause and say, God, we want to see you work here. We, we want to be here with you. We want to be attentive to what you're doing. I had a, I had a mentor one time who, um, just an incredible guy, and I'll probably, you'll, I quote him all the time for different things. One day maybe you'll get to meet him, but um, he said, you know, John, with, when we talk relationship with God, 90% of it is just showing up. God takes care of the other 10%. 90% of it is just showing up. And guess what? We all showed up. Like, we're here. Like, we're here. We're in this space. Some of us are like, barely. <laughs> like, we barely made it here, but we're, we're here. And guess what? Now it's a chance for us to take kind of a deep breath and say, okay, God, what do you want to do? How do you want to move? I think sometimes when, with just life happening, it can be very easy to live in the midst of the busyness and the craziness and kind of start holding your breath. And I think this could be one of those times where you just say, let's just take a deep breath, pause, and make a space. And what I, what I would love to do is, it, it, I've, you've seen me do this before, but maybe even just if you want to put yourself in a posture where Okay, God, let's just make a space for, to be sensitive to what you're doing if you want to have your hands out. And I, we're just going to create a space of prayer. And I'm not going to pray in the beginning. I'm just going to leave it to where if you have a breath prayer that you would like to speak, maybe it's, God, I need, God, I, I, I need to hear this from you, or God, give me eyes to see, or maybe there's hope that you need. Maybe you just want to hear God's voice. Whatever it is, I'm just going to give you a chance to speak that out first, and then I'll pray for us all. God, we recognize that we need you. We're thankful for you. Thank you for, thank you for forgiveness and grace. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your, your open ears to hear us. Pray, God, that you'd give us open hearts and open ears to exactly what you want to do. Lord, if there's hope that we need, I pray that you would give hope. If there's peace that we need, I pray that you would give us peace. I pray that you'd give us wisdom and words. Give us a sensitivity deep within us to, to hear exactly what you're saying. Give us eyes to see your fingerprints all around us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Um, I, I wanna tell you about, I, <laughs> I, I know the irony in what I'm about to say. I'm gonna give you a couple prayer requests. I know we just had a prayer time, so I probably should have done that before, but hey. Um, but if you know Barry, Barry's on staff here. He runs all of our ministry partners. Um, he does a lot more than that, but it's one of the things that he does um, with us. And 
Um, we, we have some incredible kind of missions things that are happening. Well, Barry is leaving this morning on a trip to go visit a couple of our mission, like, mission partners um, overseas. And so I just asked him to kind of give us a couple of prayers. If you wouldn't mind just be praying for his trip. He's gone for several days. Um, and he gave me these three. So if you wouldn't mind, if, you, if, you're, if you're a note taker, jot these down because I think these are cool things to be praying for his trip as he's, um, as he's yeah, just working with some of um, just some cool missions projects. Uh, the first one is, is that Barry would be an encouragement spiritually and emotionally to the workers and their family. Um, and I think, I think he's, he's going to enjoy seeing them and seeing what they're doing. Uh, they've asked him to come over to help with them setting up a business. And so he's going to be kind of giving wisdom. So he said that one of his prayer requests is that he would be led by the Spirit in evaluating the situation and helping the team make good decisions for the future, um, setting up the company and also how to connect um, with the people groups around him. Um, and then the third thing is, is that he asked for, that we'd pray that he would stay healthy and hydrated. Uh, the first one is, is he can't come back and let, if, if he doesn't test negative for COVID. Um, he was able to leave this morning because he tested negative last night. So he's praying that that stays and he can come back when he's supposed to um, in several days. The other thing is he's going to be in like 100 degree or 100 degree plus um, with like kind of full humidity every day. So he's going to be living the exact opposite of us. Um, so I tell you what, every time you feel cold or you want to complain about the weather, we're going to pray for Barry and where he's at right now because he's praying for air conditioning and we're praying for heat. So does that sound good? Does that work? Can we do that? That's a good reminder. Like when you're, when you're like, oh, I got to put a jacket on again. Oh, I'm going to pray for Barry because he would hate the thought of a jacket right now. So does that sound good? Does that work? Can we do that? So just commit that to prayer. And, and when he gets back, I know he'll give us some updates on what's going on. So um, hey, as a church, uh, we're, we're diving into the origin story of where church started, where, like, where churches like us come from, the whole like, history of it. It's in this book in the New Testament called the book of Acts, kind of gives us this history lesson of how things developed kind of after, after Jesus' story took place, where did it go next? Today, we're going to be in Acts 9, and it's this pivotal story of what takes place for the next, like, 20 chapters of the book of Acts, and it's going to be, it's a really cool story, but um, so I've, what I've done is I want to read through the whole story. It's like 20 verses, and here's what I want, didn't, I didn't want to subject you to my voice this whole time, um, so I've asked one of our friends from right here at North Point, Megan, um, she's going to come and help us read the story. She is one of my daughter's favorite teachers at Summit Middle School. Anybody else go to Summit here? Anybody Summiters? They were all, oh, there's one over there. I see it. I see it. I see that hand. Okay, no, no, but I've um, got a couple, and so Megan's going to read for us today. Thanks for, thanks for doing this. Thank I'm you gonna, for me. Absolutely. I'm going to give you the table. Okay. <laughs> I'm Megan. Hi. Hi. <laughs> the road to Damascus. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. He went to the high priest and requested letters from him to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any men or women who belonged to the way, he might bring them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he traveled and was nearing Damascus, a light from heaven suddenly flashed around him. Falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? He said. I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting, he replied. But get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the sound but seeing no one. Then Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they took him by the hand and led him into Damascus. He was unable to see for three days and did not eat or drink. There was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, here I am, Lord, he said. Get up and go to the street called Straight, the Lord said to him, to the house of Judas and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, since he is praying there. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and placing his hands on him so he can regain his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard from many people about this man how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem, and he has authority here from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for this man is my chosen instrument to take my name to Gentiles, kings, and the Israelites. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. So Ananias left and entered the house. Then he placed his hands on him and said, 
Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road you were traveling, has sent me so that you can regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. At once, something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul was with the disciples in Damascus for some days. Immediately, he began proclaiming Jesus in the synagogues. He is the Son of God. But all who heard him were astounded and said, Isn't this the man who in Jerusalem was destroying those who called on this this name and then came here for the purpose of taking them as prisoners to the chief priests? Thanks for reading. You did a great job. Okay, so this... There's so much in this story, and honestly, we could spend hours, I won't do that to you, on this story, um, and because this is, a, this is a huge turning point in the story of the church. This guy named Saul, um, if you're familiar with his story, he later becomes Paul, and Luke starts referring to him as Paul in chapter 13, and he is the guy who basically starts taking the, like, the church all throughout the Roman Empire. And so what we're going to do is Jeremy's going to, when he gets back, he's going to be digging into Paul's story. You're going to be hearing a ton about Saul and Paul, or Saul who later becomes Paul, in the next couple weeks. Here's what I thought we would do today, is I thought we would kind of tell a story that I think is about an unsung hero. I think commonly an untold story, because I think it, it really goes down, it goes to this guy who is just doing normal things, and what ends up happening and how God uses him, I think, is a fascinating story. So we're going to, we're going to dive into the story of Ananias today. Ananias is this is guy, we don't know a ton about him. Here's what I do know is this story right here that, um, that Megan just read is so important that Paul actually retells this story later in the book of Acts, so it's going to come up again of this conversion story, and we find out, and this is really what we know about Ananias, is we know that he's faithful, and we know that he's highly regarded um, with the followers of Jesus in this area. That's all we really know about him, but I think there's some things that we can understand about who he is based on the story, and I'd like to just point those out today. So the first one is this, is Saul is on his way to Damascus, and what he's been doing is he's gotten letters from the leadership in Jerusalem to start taking to follower, he's, he started, like, he got, uh, let me see how I want to say this, sorry, Uh, he got permission to start taking followers of the way to prison. So followers of the way were basically Jesus followers because Christian wasn't used as a term back then. Christian really was a, like an insult. And so, because what it was, it was this reference to being a little Christ. And so that's what that means is being just all these little Christs. So Christian actually became an insult. Followers of the way is how they usually referred to it. So Paul, who we first met when Stephen got martyred that we talked about a few weeks ago, um, he's on his way to go start arresting people who love Jesus basically. And on the way, he's given this vision. And what I think is interesting is there's two visions in the passage. The first vision is the one that Paul has. And then the second one is the one that Ananias has. And I want to use the comparison of the two just to kind of see if we learn something quickly about who Ananias is. So here's what I'm going to do is I'm going to put them both up. So he fell to the ground. This is Paul's story on the top half. He fell to the ground and, and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, who are, who you are perse- whom you are persecuting, he replied. I want to pay attention to Ananias' response. I want to see if, if, you th- if you see a different response in Ananias the way when he gets a similar vision. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. Is there a difference? Yay, nay. Yeah, there's a big difference. Paul is his response is, who is this? Now, given Paul's blinded, there's been a lot of things going on with Paul, so I'll get it. But I think we see a big difference here. Ananias' initial response is, yeah, Lord? Like, it's basically like you just, like, he just picked up the phone and was like, hey, mom, how are you? Like, I mean, it was like so common that he understood who this was and that we were going to be in this conversation. I thought that was, I think that's really interesting because it, tell it tells us a little bit about who, who Ananias is. Just so you know, his response when it says, yes, Lord, actually is a throwback to several people in the Old Testament who all heard God's voice and replied the exact same way in the language. So Abraham hears God's voice, and the first thing he says is, here I am. Samuel hears God's voice, and he responds with, here I am. Isaiah hears God's voice, and he responds with, here I am. And in the original language, this is a little different version. 
Ananias, when he hears God's voice, he looks at God and says, here I am. It's a throwback to this, this deep recognition that God's talking to me and I want to be exactly where I am. So I'm going to warn you, this message today is going to be highly simplistic, okay? And I'm going to point out just a couple like small things because I think they have profound impact. But here's first point. If you're a note taker, first point is this. I think Ananias, it just shows us that he recognizes God's voice. And I think that's key. Because it automatically tells us that Ananias has this familiarity with God. We can see that there's this relationship with, with God that's already taking place, that Ananias has already been practicing and moving in, so that when God gets his attention, his, immediately, his immediate response is, yeah, yeah, what, what are we talking about today, God? What, what are we going to do? And so then what happens is, Ananias hears from God, recognizes God's voice, and then God tells him to go do something. Hey, you know that guy Saul who helped murder Stephen and has been talking about killing people in this area and he's on his way here right now with papers to arrest you and your family and your friends and to take you back to Jerusalem in chains? You know that guy? Yeah. I want you to go pray for him right now. Can, can, you, can you put yourself in Ananias' space for that, for, in that with just a second? Okay, God tells you, I want you to go pray for the person who could basically change your life as you know it and not for a positive way what would you do? Is there many of us that would honestly jump up and go? I don't know. I don't know what I would do in that situation, but here's what I love, is I can imagine that Ananias is putting this in perspective and saying, wait, 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 this is the guy who is threatening my life. This is the guy who's threatening our friend's lives. And here's what I love, is that's exactly what he does. He looks back at God, and this is what he says. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all, of, and all the harm he has done to your people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. This is Ananias' conversation with God. The Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to proclaim, and the, sorry, and, the, and to the people of Israel. And I will show him how much he will suffer for my name. Again, this is going to sound really simple. But I think if we look at Ananias' story, we have to give him this. Ananias does this thing that I think is kind of harder than we think, but he's actually really honest with God. In this story, we see Ananias. I, I, here's what I love, is I love that Ananias doesn't hear this and robotically be like, okay, I'm going to go pray for him. Like, you can actually see Ananias' thought process like, whoa, 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 God. You're asking me to go pray for the guy who's threatening me right now. Can we have a quick conversation? And he does this. And he pauses and long enough to say, hey, can I just be honest here? This is what I've heard about this guy. This is what I know about him. Is that going to change? Is, is that what you're inviting me into? I know that, that those are simple words. Ananias is honest with God. But if, with our, if we're kind of if we're real for a moment, how often are we honest with God? How often do we, do we pause long enough in life to really tell God where we're at and to really tell God what we're thinking? I was reading this study in the last few days, actually, and one of the things that I, I thought was fascinating is this, and it, I, I was looking for a percentage because I really wanted to give you a number here. All it said was majority, and I'm like, rats, because I wanted to be like, this much of us. No, but, but this is what it said. The majority of people... Like in the U.S., is, this was, it was based in the U.S., are actually more emotionally illiterate than we, than we know. The majority of people are actually emotionally illiterate more than we, we know. We all overestimate how much we understand our own emotions. Which means sometimes we'll say, I'm angry, but what could really be happening is, I'm really embarrassed because of the shame I feel. But what we do is wrap it up to just being, I'm angry right now, and I've got to do something with my anger. And what I think I see Ananias doing is he's willing to enter in such a conversation with God that he kind of looks at God and says, hey, God, this is where I'm at right now. I need you to speak a little bit more into this. And I think that's a key lesson for us. I think that's a key reminder. Because no matter what's happening, no matter what's going on, this is the God who's going to meet with us the God who's going to hear what's going on in our hearts, the God who's going to listen. Now, I'm going to pause here, because I think there's a possible other side of the story. 
Because is there anybody that would be like me? This might be my, like, this might just be my mindset, and I'll, I'll, I'll repent for this later. But <laughs> is, is there anybody else that would be like, huh, if I'm Ananias, and I don't think, if, if this is the way it played out, Ananias would not make the Bible because this is probably not a loving story. So this is probably why I'm not in the Bible. Um, just kidding. But so I wonder if this, okay, I wonder, does anybody else think this? Ananias says, okay, God, I know you want me to go pray for Paul, but wait, did you say he's blinded and he's stuck? Is there anybody else that kind of pauses a little bit and is like, hmm, this is the guy who's causing a lot of problem for the church. Can't we just lock the door? Like, like kind of pause and like back up a little bit and be like, what, Paul? Like, what, saw? And I mean, I, but I don't know. Again, <laughs> I'm totally just like letting you know my thought process. This I'm like, and we, then Ananias doesn't go there. This isn't the way it happens. But there's a part of me that's like, I wonder if that ever crossed Ananias' mind. I'll tell you, I'll, I'll pause here real quick. Because I think this, this story kind of speaks into the judgment that we can hold for people sometimes. How we like, we learn something about somebody. And maybe it's somebody that we just notice and we see and we automatically feel like we ought to know their whole story based on how they look, right? I know no one else does this, right? Anybody? Is anybody else professional at this? Or there's those people that we get to know and we kind of automatically think that that's how they're always going to be and they can't change. I'll tell you my story on this, that God rocked my world with this, is of how God kind of revealed how I can judge people and how I need to be a little bit more open-minded on things is we used to, many of you know, we used to live in China and right outside of where we used to live, there was this, it was crazy. There was this eight line, eight lane road. It was two eight lane roads that came into an intersection with a red light. It was wild <laughs> and not in a good way sometimes. And they always were trying to make it better. So one of the things that they did it, that, that made it better, but it was awful. Like I, I, could, I detested being at this light because what would happen is you would drive up and there was this little tiny screen above the light that had these two numbers and it was the countdown for when you got the green light again. And so you would pull up to it, and it was two numbers. The, th the sad thing is, is the light was two minutes long. So 9-9 nine, nine would show up, and you knew it wasn't moving for a good 21 seconds. So you'd sit at the light, and you'd stare at 9-9, nine, nine, and then all of a sudden it would go 9-9, nine, 9-8. Nine, nine, nine. It was like the longest, like what, the 100 bottles of beer song or whatever? Or it was like the longest thing ever for that, because you just felt like you were sitting there for an eternity. So one day, and... And I, we have this a little bit, like I've seen some places where this is, but this was a key road because there were so many cars that there would be a lot of people who needed help or maybe who were down and out and they would stand on the side of the corner there or they would walk in between the cars looking for, you know, either food or water or money or whatever they needed. And so like it was very common to have, you know, people coming by or people on the, on the corners and things. And so one day I pull up, I'm about four cars from the light and I look up and it just changed. So I get red nine nine on the door and I'm like, uh, again. So I do what everybody else does. I get my phone out and I'm like, well, you can polish off a few emails in 99 seconds. I get, well, 120 <laughs> seconds. So I start like doing this, okay? And so look, well, all of a sudden I catch a shadow and right in my window, like, like touching the glass is a man. And I'm like, whoa, and he startles me. So it's like, ah, like, I mean, it's pretty like, I think I screamed. It was probably high-pitched. It's okay. And um, I don't have, a, don't have a low screen. No, it's good. So I look, and there's a, there's a gentleman standing there who just was in a rough place. And what had happened was he, it looked like he had been burned severely, and his, and his wounds were still very, very fresh. And so, like, he had bur had been so burned on his face that his, it, it's like his face was deformed, like... Where, where the things are that would normally be in the right place in a face was not in the right place anymore. So immediately I look up and I'm startled. And I, I, I immediately in my mind, I'm like, I don't know what to do with this. And, I, and this is where it, like, I will forever regret this decision and this is why it's a story because I'm not the hero in this story at all. Um, but I'll tell you exactly what I did is I, I did nothing. I waited the 99 seconds, which felt like an eternity. And I sat there. And then I drove off and I went about my day. 
But I'll tell you what I did inside. Inside, I did a whole lot of judging. Inside, I did a whole lot of like, uh, I, this is not where I want to be, kind of ignored it, I kind of shut down. And I tell you that to say, I think sometimes we can do this, where we see something or we learn something about somebody, and all of me, immediately, instead of entering in, we just let it be, and when possibly we could do something. Now, I've been a youth pastor for like 20 years, and so this is the cool part of the story, is because sometimes teenagers can teach you a whole lot more than you'll ever teach them. Anybody who's worked in kids or youth ministry knows this. And so about an hour later, a 15-year-old kid that's in our youth group pulls up, and he was in a taxi with three of his buddies, and they were gonna go down, they were gonna go down to the markets in Beijing, go shopping. And he pulls up, and he sees the same man. And what he does is he says, hey, guys, I'll meet you down in town. I'm going to get out. So he gets out of his taxi and walks up, and he says, hey, what's your name? And the guy tells him his name. And then he spent the next 20 minutes getting the story of Xiao Wang was his name. And what happened with Xiao Wang was Xiao Wang was building some houses near us, and he was a migrant worker, which meant a lot of people would come from across the country with little means and little resources. They would get paid a, min a very minor salary. They would live in like these like little huts and they would just work full all around days building these houses. And what happened is Xiao Wang was in a room where there was a chemical fire. He didn't get out. So he was covered in chemicals that nobody could stop him. His boss didn't want to pay for the hospital bill. His boss also didn't see him now as being useful. So he kicked him off the job site. He'd been working for six months and never made a dime. And now Xiao Wang was standing at this street corner trying to figure out how do I get back 3,000 miles home and how do I heal from injuries? And Justin was the kid in our youth group. Justin got to know his story and basically turned it into an amazing story. Xiao Wang came to know Jesus. Xiao Wang got surgeries that kind of fixed all of his wounds. He's actually doing great. He's back home with his family. He's doing really well now. But I tell you all of that to tell you that just so you know, I'm learning this. But I think sometimes you and I can live in judgments of people where God wants to nudge us and say, hey, I don't think you see that person the way I see them. Can we move that a little bit? Can we change that a little bit? Because they're on a story with me just like you are. And I think sometimes we have to be reminded of that. Yeah? Does that make sense? Yeah? And I think Ananias is in this space where he says, he tells God his fear, he tells God his worry, and then God says, no, I'm, I, you're, you're going to go pray. You're going to go do this. And this is what Ananias does, is Ananias goes. Ananias then went to the house. This is in verse 17. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Again, these are simple, but Ananias follows God despite of his fears. So despite his fears, Putting those aside, he says, okay, God, you're calling me to it. I'm going to walk out in this. I'm going to take a step into what you're calling me, even though it might not be what I loved and what I, what I wanted to sign up for. And here's the neat thing that happens. And, I, and I, you know Ananias had no clue that this was about to take place, but this is what, this is what the story tells us, is Ananias' small step of trusting God has this huge impact. Saul a couple chapters later, it becomes Paul. The rest of the book of Acts is about him because Paul writes like 25, or I think it's like 28% of the New Testament is what Paul writes. He writes 13 of the 27 books. He starts churches all across the Roman Empire. Like the Roman Empire changes because of Paul's ministry specifically. And you know Ananias had no clue walking across this town to this house where he's going to pray for this guy who's threatening his life that that's going to happen. He has no idea. But just the fact that he took a step just the fact that he took the step and says, okay, God, I'm going to listen to what, you, what you're telling me. God, God changes the trajectory of the church because of that. So what I thought was, I thought there might be a couple things that God might be inviting us into through Ananias' story, kind of through this unsung hero. And here's the first one. Is I think the first thing that God's inviting us into is an invitation to lean into God and to recognize his voice. Here's what we learned about Ananias. He's, he's a faithful guy who's taking steps to get to know God regularly. In John 10, when Jesus starts talking about how he's the good shepherd, he uses language like, my sheep know my, like, know my voice. They hear my voice and they can respond to it. And here's the deal. The only way we can learn someone's voice is when we practice hearing it, right? When we practice sitting in it, when we practice recognizing it. There can be a friend that calls you that you haven't talked to for 10 years and you pick up the phone and they say, hey, and you're like, I have no clue who this is. 
But your mom calls you and immediately you know who it is, right? Because you know the voice. Because you've spent time there. Because there's been practice. And I think the same thing is with God. Here's the deal. I, there's a lot of times when I, I will totally agree. I feel like sometimes God can be a thousand miles away or a bajillion miles away, however far you want to put it. But here's what I also know is that God is constantly speaking to us. God is constantly whispering to us. And sometimes it's more about us putting ourselves in a place to hear him than it is whether or not he's loud enough. Sometimes we have to rise above the noise and the busyness of life and actually sit and pause. That's kind of why we did that today, where we say, Let's, can we just make a space for God to speak? Because sometimes we're running away from it quicker than we think. Or let's... Or, you know, it could be something different. It could be that you're here this morning and we're talking about this and it could be you've never actually made a decision to be in a relationship with Jesus. Could be, could be you're here today and you're saying, God, I have wanted to be close to you for, for so long. Maybe you've never taken that step where you've said, Jesus, I want you in my life and I invite you in. And I thought, you know what? Let's just make space for that right now. Let's just take a quick minute and say, hey, if, if you're here today and you've never come to the place where you've decided, kind of like we saw two stories. We saw one today earlier in the first service and Priya's story right here where they've come to a place where they know they need Jesus in their life. And if you're sitting here this morning and you're like, I, I don't think I've ever done that. Well, let's just pause and pray. Can we do that? So God, if, if we're here today and we know we've come to a place where we've We've invited you into our lives, Lord. I pray, God, that you would turn up the very volume of your voice. But if there's anybody here in this moment who's in a space where they're like, God, I, I don't hear from you, and I don't feel like I have a relationship with you. God, I pray that you would give them the boldness in this moment right now to pray and ask. I pray that you give them the boldness to invite you into their life right now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So, you know, if that's something that you want to talk more about, I love having those kinds of conversations. A lot of, our, a lot of our leaders here do. And so if you want to talk more about that or have questions about what it means to have a relationship with God or growing in there, um, you know, there's those communicate cards in your chairs. Fill one of those out. Drop it by the doors. And we'd love to kind of talk more. Or, you know, it's just saying if maybe you're here watching a baptism and you're like, I need to do that. You know, let us know. Let's, let's jump into the conversation. Let's, let's dive in and Let's work on that because that's all part of just working in our relationship with God. Does that sound good? Is that good? Okay. So another one for you. Um, so I think another invitation that Ananias has for us, the story that Ananias has is it's an invitation to learn and grow closer to God in the disruption of our comfort. This is always an interesting one because here's the deal. No one likes to be uncomfortable, Right? Even sitting here today, you might be saying it's too hot or it's too cold. I'm just kidding. I know you're not complaining about that. I know. But here's the deal. Nobody likes to be uncomfortable. But the other part of reality is, is no one grows in comfort, right? Let's try it this week. You ready? Everybody just sit on the couch all week long and see if we end up with a six pack. I did not, by the way. I tried it this past week just to get ready for the message and it did not have. No, we don't grow muscle that way. The only way that you grow muscle is working out, right? The only way that you can get smarter is working out your brain. The only way we grow, if we want to grow spiritually, then guess what? God's going to bring some disruption to your comfort. And we have to be willing to be okay with that. And I think what, Ananias, what we see in this story of Ananias is him being put in a place where, I, my guess is, is he was a little uncomfortable walking down that street, going to a house where someone could could end his life, let alone change it for negative, right? My, my, my guess is, is that he was uncomfortable. But I also guess is that he loved seeing what God was going to do as he stepped out in this uncomfortable place. And guess what? God's going to invite you and I to do those same things. You know, I, something that I've been talking to people recently about is sometimes, sometimes that uncomfortable thing can be praying out loud, does anybody, give me, don't, I'm not going to raise for hands. Are you, does anybody uncomfortable praying out loud? Anybody? Give me a nod. You know? Or like, uh, here's another crazy thing. Sorry, this is not in my script at all. I'm going rogue here. Um, but like couples, like married couples that, are, that don't feel comfortable praying together. That's interesting to me. 
that's go- I know it's going to be uncomfortable. My wife and I walked in, and I'm a pastor, and we, like our first year of marriage, it was like, this is kind of odd. Like, this is, but you know what? It's an amazing thing. So if you're a couple here today, and that's something that you don't commonly do, try it. It'll be uncomfortable. I get it. It'll be, it'll feel odd maybe if you haven't been doing it, but guess what it's going to do? It's going to invite God into your relationship in a whole new way. I promise you it's going to be a chance to grow. God's going to invite us to things. He's going to invite us to step out in things. And you know what? Sometimes the prayer is going to have to be, God, I need your boldness to do this. God, I need you, I need you to give me exactly what I need to do what you're calling me to do. And it might be something very small and simple, but it's going to be amazing. I'll tell you just a couple of mine. If I, this is, I, you know, one of the times that God called me that really disrupted me was I'd lived in Asia for 15 years, and that became very, like, normal to me. I loved it. And then all of a sudden, God starts saying, I think you're going to move back to America. And I was scared to death because I was going to look like people around me, but I didn't act like anybody. And I get it. I'm weird. Um, and I'm still that way. I, I totally own that. But it, it felt, it was very uncomfortable for me. And then God says, you're going to move to Iowa. And I was like, oh, no. <laughs> now, it's been amazing. It's been amazing. But, uh, like, there was a big change there. Like, and so it's been good. It's been good. I, I, and then God says, hey, what about joining staff at North Point Church? And I'm like, you're scaring me to death, God. You people are scared. No, I'm just kidding. Um, no, but here's the deal is I'm, I, this has all been steps for me where I'm learning and growing. I, I have a lot to learn and a lot to grow in. And so me being in the job that I have right now is an opportunity for God to teach me. And guess what? It's going to come through dis- disruption of my comfort. And my job is to be open to that. And to say, okay, God, what are you, what are you calling me to next? Because I want to walk with you every step of the way. Is that making sense? Yeah? Okay, I got one more for you. Um, I think the, the third thing that we can pull from Ananias' story is just, it's an invitation to play a part in God's story even though we can't see the whole picture. Because Ananias plays this part in Paul's story and he has no clue where it's going to go and it goes in an incredible way. And guess what? By, by taking that step, he got to be a part of this huge thing. And you and I never know. By us just being faithful and being constant and saying, okay, God, what do you want to do with me right now? You have no clue where that's going to take you. But I, but I know it's going to be God doing some incredible things because it's going to be part of his story. I want to show you a, a video. There's this book um, that and it, somebody digitized it, but I think it's just, it shows this point so well. It's a, it's a book. It's great because it doesn't have any words. It's a book of all pictures. So it's perfect from anybody from like 8 to 108. Um, but here's the deal. The lesson in this book is profound. And so instead of reading it to you, I want you to watch it. And then at the end, I'm going to ask you, what, what does this story tell? Sound good?
do you think the lesson of that book is? Oh, our perspective is not God's perspective. Thanks, Gail. Well done. Good voice, too. You're speaking soon. No, I'm just <laughs> Maybe he forces us to ask the question, what am I missing, right? What part of the story don't I know yet? That there's maybe always more to the story than what I know right now, right? I think this, I, I love this. It's a kid's book, but I think it's so profound. And here at the end of the day, let's be honest, Ananias' story is about a normal dude doing normal things, and all he's doing is just walking with God. It's just in his walk, he's, he's ready to do whatever God calls him to. And he's ready to have a conversation, and he's ready to be open and honest and work through things. And he's just going to take one step at a time, and that's what we see in his story. So maybe that's a good reminder for us, is that this next week, maybe... Maybe it's more about our, just our relationship with God in the day by day. Maybe moment by moment saying, hey God, what are, you, what are you calling me to do today? In the midst of the busyness and the noise, what are you calling me to? What are you saying? Maybe it's starting to pray that prayer normally. God, give me, a, give me, give me eyes to see your fingerprints. Give me, give me a tenderness to see where you're moving and give me a boldness to jump in. But I think Ananias' story is a lot like ours, where we get to jump in and just be a part of God's story and whatever he's called us to. And sometimes we'll have no idea the profound impact. But I think it's about one step at a time. Let me pray for us.